now we can have a dialogue. And, you know, unfortunately, what happens when we start a dialogue is somebody is asking something and somebody is asking. It gets becomes a big mess. So I uh, suggested that we have questions written in a piece of paper so I can look at it. Also, I have the advantage to put the question I don't like at the back and read that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I won't do that. So. <laughs> it says, Pranam, is having a shy personality a disadvantage and does it need to be changed? Is shyness just the ego trying to hide behind a mask? That's a profound question. Sometimes, you know, the word shyness here could have also been used to say that one has an inferiority complex. Uh, uh, well, for people who are shy, I'm basically, by nature, I'm a shy person too. I sit here, I talk, and I go back and I try to run away because I don't want to meet people. So there's nothing wrong with being shy. I don't think there's any... Shyness is a, is a wonderful quality, um, uh, especially for women. I, well, I have, I like shy women. I don't know why. But, uh, uh, <laughs> so it's it's not a disqualification. I don't see that as a disqualification. It's a wonderful thing to be shy. Nothing. It's also being modest, you know, and also being sensitive. Uh, you are affected by other people, so you you feel shy. There is nothing wrong with that. But there might be some careers in this world where you cannot be shy. So you need to develop a way to get out of it sometimes. All I am saying is don't consider it as a vice. We I see. I am not glorifying it as a virtue. I may like it, but it's... Uh, but don't consider it as a vice. It's just one uh, aspect of uh, character of a certain kind of person. It doesn't matter, really. In fact, to be modest and shy are good things in some ways. But, um, what you should think when you're shy? And when you, much, many times, shyness is an expression of feeling inadequate also. And uh, it's a kind of an inferiority complex. So then, when this happens, try to develop the superiority complex. <laughs> how do we do that? I don't know if there's a word like that. Uh, how do we do that? Um, by understanding the fact that the essence of this whole universe is a spark in my heart. Therefore, I'm not just a sim nobody. There's a great hope that inside me is infinite potential. And this infinite potential would be allowed to come out if I say, no, no, I'm not so limited, I'm not so small. So then allow it to grow. Uh, I, I just use the word superiority, complex. It's, it's not a complex actually, it's an attitude. Try to move into that attitude so that you can handle this. If you want to handle it, there is nothing wrong with being shy. Hmm? And then, the second part of this question, is shyness just the ego trying to hide behind a mask? Well, what do you got to hide? I think it depends on the individual. Mm. Mm. There's something I was trying to remember. Yeah, somebody said, uh, asked the question, is life worth living? And the answer was, it depends on the liver. <laughs> <laughs> so, keep your liver in order. <laughs> uh, <okay>. <laughs> I think we won't go more. Too much temptation around, but... Uh. Yeah. Now this question is, I believe you said, yes I did, <laughs> that Om is the bridge that links this world with the other. 
Can you elaborate on this, on the importance of Om? Now, I don't know how long this is going to take because you are asking me a, such a serious question and it's, well, we'll try to keep it as concise as possible, if you don't mind, yeah. Now, Om, first of all, get rid of the idea that Om is the sound that belongs to any particular denomination. From our understanding, Om is a universal sound. Just because it's in a particular language written doesn't mean that it belongs to any denomination. It's a denomination-less sound. It's an, it, it's an, an well, it has, be, it has been referred to in a different way, not as Om, but as sound and also as the word. If you go back to some of the Eastern scriptures, you have the mention of the beginning was the word. Word means sound. And when you say word, and someone said, I'm the alpha and the omega. If you say the omega is om. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, now, the general description of om is that it's a three-syllable word with a, u, and m. Mm. Om. A, u, and m which is O, nothing to do with this M. So, when, so A is supposed to represent the origin of this universe. Because it's the first simple word which even a, a dumb person can pronounce. A. And, therefore, it represents the origin of the universe, from simple A to B, C and so on, A, B, C, and the alphabet. You know, Sanskrit has a beautiful uh, word for alphabet, it's called akshara, which means indistractable. So A is the basic sound which represents creation, origin, and U is the middle sound, the middle of your tongue, which means what has been created needs to be also, uh, let's not use the word creation, what has originated has to be also sustained. That sustaining part is the O. And when you say Aum, we are close to your mouth. If you need to utter another word, then you need to open your mouth again. You can't do it otherwise. So that is the end of that which was which originated. So it, creation, preservation, and transformation, destruction. Destruction is actually transformation because if you don't destroy the old, there is no space for the new. So this thing is, this is the usual explanation, the philosophical meaning of Om. But there is also another philosophical meaning of Om. We discussed this just now, actually. And that is, A, uh, the first syllable, represents the waking state. This is from the Mandukya Upanishad. And O, Om, so O represents the dream state. And when you say Om, all finished is the deep sleep. And then once you have said Om, you don't suddenly say Om. Om. You know that half said sound, the unstuck sound, this is Turiya, or that which is the witness of all the three states, which is free of everything. So this is the meaning of Om. However, Om is just not the meaning, but the sound is a very potent thing that can connect the human organism to that which is beyond. When I say beyond, it starts with going inside first. When you touch the inside, then you see that the outside and the inside are the same. There is no difference. Uh, let me put it this way. Okay, now, if you chant the sound of Om, either as Om or as Om, and continue to chant it with your attention on some of the centers of the human psyche, then it's possible for you to connect to your inner essence and when you are connected to your 
the core of your being, your consciousness, then you're connected to the consciousness that pervades the universe. So this is the sound that can link you from the ordinary to the extraordinary. And you don't have to think it's Hindu, Christ, this, nothing. Just think of it as a pure sound and chant it. We generally do it with complete attention on this part, which is called the Ajna, which is a very powerful and important psychic center in the human constitution. So, fix your attention there. And uh, before we chant, we what we do is knock a few times. Uh, careful if your nails are sharp. But, um, and then, where the feeling is of a little bit of pain, fix your attention there and chant Om. Try it and see what happens, how it works. Chant a long Om. Om. And give a lot of stress to the last sound, Ma. Mm. You know, this sound, M, at the end, Ma, is by itself a very soothing sound. You go into a place where patients are convalescing and the commonest sound you hear is mm, hmm, mm, because it's built in. The brain knows that this sound brings about some healing and peace. Huh? So when you put all this together then you have Om. And daily chanting of Om after knocking here. Knock and it shall be opened unto thee. Huh? And then Therefore, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So fix your attention here and chant Om and then find out for yourself the link. <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> It seems like most of the gurus in India are men. Why is that? <laughs> it needs some celebration. I'm trying to figure out why. Uh, well, I would say that it's not really true that most of the teachers in India are men. When you use the word gurus, then you're referring to the new generation, probably. Uh, um, in fact, um, it, this is very interesting that there are more gurus than disciples these days. <laughs> and we, say, mm, I'm sorry, but... Huh. So, uh, <coughs> I really can't find an explanation for this question. However, I know that in ancient times there have been great teachers who have been women not only men. If you go back to the Upanishadic period, there's a great teacher called Gargi, who was so powerful that she sat, sits in the council of rishis and says, I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't answer this question, your head will fall off. <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not that she's going to kill somebody, but you know, the weight given to this uh, great teacher, it's not like that. But I think sometime in the history of uh, religion and religious teachings and philosophy, uh, it became kind of a matri uh, patriarchal society and slowly uh, pater became more important than mother. And therefore we don't find so many women. I have no other explanation. Also, when you are a yogi, Usually it, entire, it means that you need lead a wandering life, you go off to the Himalayas, you stay in caves, you learn. And those days perhaps the women were not equipped to do that. Hmm? However, as time goes on, I have a feeling that we have had enough of these men gurus. Why don't somebody else take over? Don't ask me why there weren't. We can change this record now. Why not? There are women teachers. It's not that there aren't in India, in other places. But like somebody asked me, many of them are modest, so they don't want to say we are gurus, maybe. Uh, my suggestion is, it's a time to change this now. 
I would be very happy if any one of the ladies here would want to become gurus. In the real sense of the term, not to, not a money spinning racket or something, but you know what I mean. Uh, it would be wonderful to do that. Uh, also, let me tell you that women are not less qualified than men to take up the teachings. Yes, that's very clear. The teaching is addressed to not only to men. If you take some of the traditional textbooks of yoga, which belong to the Nath Sampradaya, well, I belong to this tradition, most of the teachings are the great yogi god Shiva teaching Parvati, his wife. Look, listen, this is what yoga is all about. Which means what? Then she can transmit it to others, so she has already become a teacher. Mm-hmm. So, you are right that there are less m- women than men in this field, but you can change it if you want. <laughs> I'm being serious. If you do it, then I think more people will learn this. In India, for instance, not only in India, everywhere, the first influence that the child has is from the mother. And if the mother can change, then the child would also be changed. So, while it's a good question, which I'm not able to answer in entirety, uh, it's a good uh, suggestion that you have given, so that we can change the status quo now. Turn it around a bit. Should I read this question? Here's a word used, which is so common, is we all use, sometimes not even realizing what we're talking about. Someone has asked me this question, how would you define love? Did you, obviously my autobiography has been read, did you and Maheshwanath Babaji discuss love? Maheshwanath Babaji is was my is my was my will be my guru, mm-hmm. my teacher. Not so well known, of course, hardly known before. I think I wrote my autobiography. Mm. So have we discussed love, and how would I define love? Well, I would, love is something which we really cannot define, but since the question is asked, I would like to say that love is uh, no words. Uh, It's so close to what the Upanishads describe as the truth. When they say, yet dvajana bhutitam, that which words cannot describe. Uh, mm, there are many kinds of love. There is physical love, there is love between the mother and the child, there is love between two good friends. But if you really want to stress the importance, the core of love would be selflessness, I think. When there is love, then you don't ask for anything, you would rather give. I think that is a very good definition of love. And if there is mutual love between two, you don't expect anything from each other. You just want to live with that love, with that feeling. If you don't get anything out of it, it, it's worth without taking or giving. It's not a give and take. It's not a business. You know what I mean? A give and take is business. Love is something very close to the word, the big word. I'm very worried about using it, compassion. Love is uh, when the heart melts, when you hear the cry of a child on the street. Love is when you want to give everything that you have and say, "Ah, let that person be happy. Hmm? Love is also when you share feelings mutually 
and don't put each other down. You know, in, in, when two people love each other, I think they're on an equal footing. There is nothing, nobody's down and nobody's up. And I think true love can happen only when all egotistic feelings are set aside, then there is love. Um, I don't know anything more to say on this uh, question because there's nothing you can say about love. You become silent. The second part of the question is, did you and Mahishwanath Babaji discuss love? We were in love. We didn't discuss love. In a different way. You know what I mean. Uh, I don't know how to explain this because the connection between us was so deep that after a while we were not two different entities but one. Uh, not separate. So if this can happen with hearts, then we have love. Otherwise love is a word. This in me. Okay. I'm going to explain uh, I'm going to give you an example of not what we call, there is nothing called ordinary or extraordinary love, but still in gradation for practical purposes. Let's say there is this ordinary love between two young people. Well, you might explain it, it's a hormonal love, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Everything has some chemical basis. Even in meditation when I say, oh, I feel good, which means some serotonin has gone into your bloodstream. So, mm, there is a chemical basis, it doesn't matter. Suppose two young people are in love and they stand for hours together doing nothing, speaking nothing, just looking at each other's eyes. What are they doing? Can you explain it? We cannot. In, we had a Hindi movie in India called Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. <laughs> Something is happening, but we don't know what's happening. So, so, if this cannot be explained, we just cannot explain love in a divine way. It's difficult. Words fail. But it certainly is that in true love, there is no give and take, no, I mean, no expectation of profit. It's not a business. You give. You don't expect anything. This is not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> it says, could we go with you to Mount Kailash sometime? <laughs> well, we could, but I need to work out how, why, when. Uh, let me tell you this, this Mount Kailash is a wonderful place up there, but uh, it's not possible, especially now that it is in Chinese territory, uh, for huge group of people to go together there. You need to go in small little groups. And the moment I announced that I'm going to Kailash, I don't know how big that group is going to be. So it's kind of, we need to look at the logistics. I've taken people before, but for some years I haven't been. Maybe I would, I'm, now I've turned 70, so I, if I have to do it, I have to do it fast. Because be, well, I'm still able to walk. <laughs> I hope I, I walk for a few more years because Babaji has given me some work and I know that till the work is complete, he's not going to let me get out. So, we'll see. I can't promise you anything on this matter. Sorry. But keep uh, keep an eye uh, and see if there's any stirring in that direction and be fast. If you find something happening in, on the website or somewhere, quickly apply. First come, first served. <laughs> now this is a somewhat a technical uh, question which is uh, to do with the different schools of thought in India regarding uh, philosophy. The question is first, thank you very much, God bless you. Somebody says, pranams. Uh, 
Advaita or Dvaita. Technical ground. Or a healthy blend. How do we reconcile? <coughs> now, first the word Advaita and then Dvaita. Advaita means, you know, the ancient teachings in India, the Upanishads, were interpreted by different teachers in different ways. But the wonderful thing about it is that it can be interpreted in different ways. That doesn't disqualify it. It actually qualifies it. Because if something is infinite, there must be infinite ways of looking at it. If it's finite, there could be only one way of looking at it. If it's infinite, then there must be infinite ways of looking at it. Now, among them, one of the major way of looking at the teachings is Advaita, which means there is only one supreme reality existing. And according to pure Advaita, which was advocated by the great Shankara, the great religious teacher, the philosophy, the philosopher whose name was Adi Shankara. When I say Adi Shankara, I am talking about the first Shankara, not about the any other Shankaras now. Mm -hmm. So, he explained and interpreted the teachings of the Upanishads in the Advaitic form, the philosophy called Advaita, which said that there is only one reality, which is called the Brahman, so what about the diverse universe that you see? It's a very extreme view. He said that I universe, it doesn't exist. There's only one reality. Uh, in fact, he defined it by saying, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. He said, this world is a lie. It doesn't exist. And he gave an example, which is also given by the Buddhists. The example is that in the night, you see a rope and mistake it for a snake. And you have all the reactions of having seen a snake. But when you switch on the light, your flashlight, what? It's not a snake, it's a rope. So all your reactions were illusions. So he said, this is the world that we see. And the only reality, there is no snake, there is only the rope. The Supreme Brahman. Okay, that's one philosophy. I would say that's one way of looking at it. Then you go to the next one. After a period of time, the Advaita philosophy of Shankara became kind of a dry matter of discussion with people. There was no heart in it. Where people only, oh, this world is an illusion. So if it's an illusion, you don't have to love, you're not concerned about hate, nothing is all gone. So came another great teacher called Ramanuja, who introduced what is called Vishishta Advaita. He said, yeah, there's only one, but there are also many, and the many can become one. And he also introduced devotion into the practice. I'm not saying that Shankara did not have devotion. He had. But then people stressed more on these hair-splitting arguments with, of Advaita than the essence of Advaita. So it de degenerated. At this point came Ramanuja, who said, well, that there is Supreme Brahman and he renamed the Supreme Brahman as Narayana. Mm -hmm. And he said that this conscious Supreme Being is there of course, but the world is not an illusion. The world is an illusion as the world is an illusion only when you understand the truth, not before that. When you're still in this relative world, it's real. When you understand, ah, then you see, like waking up from a dream. And he also said, the difference between a human being, who also has a spark of the divine, and the supreme being, who is the originator of this universe, is like this. He said, the content of water, the chemical formula of water is H2O. Right? He didn't say H2O, I'm just giving a name. He probably didn't know organic chemistry. So, H2O, water everywhere is H2O, in the sea, in the river. Uh, also, if you have a bowl of water, a small cup full of water put on the table, this is also H2O. It's water. Basically, it's the same. Qualitatively, it's the same, but not quantitatively. He said, while this is water, 
and the sea is also water, you can't run a ship on this little bowl of water that you have on the table. That's the difference between the human soul and the supreme being. So he kind of divided it a bit. I don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing, but he did. Then came another teacher called Madhva, who was quite fed up with these people saying this world is an illusion and still eating, drinking, making merry. He said, if this is an illusion, why are you indulging in all these things? He said, this world is real. The supreme reality is real. Both are real. This cannot become that because if the finite, which is the human being, can become the infinite, then that is not infinite because an infinite is not a conglomeration of finites. You cannot find an infinite where you, all finites gather together. It cannot be infinite is infinite. Finite is finite. So then what is realization? According to Madhva, when the mind is completely clean of all impurities and distractions and tensions, then the divine is reflected in the heart. That's all you can do, he said. Absolutely fine. Now these are three views of the same thing. And I think there could be a million views because we are all different and at the same time one. Um, actually what is can be found out only when you have your own personal spiritual experience, not otherwise. Um, this is where we have this beautiful story that comes from the Jain sources, ancient Jain. The Jain system of thought is a very ancient system in India. Uh, the Jain story, which was adapted later by a great Sufi teacher called Jalaluddin Rumi. I'm sure many people have heard of Rumi, who started the order of the whirling dervishes. Mm -hmm. So, um, he adapted this story beautifully and popularized it. Actually, the source is Jain. It is about three blind men who go to find out what an elephant is all about. Blind men. So one of the blind men touches the foot of the elephant, the limb. And he says an elephant is defined as a huge pillar-like structure, like an oak tree or something. Very rough and so on, but it moves. And we have been warned that if you do go too close, it might land on your head, and that's the end. His definition of the elephant. He can't see the elephant, of course, he's blind. The second blind man touches the tail of the elephant and defines the elephant as, uh, well, there were no bathroom brushes then, but something like that, like a broom, which moves all the time, constantly, and which has bristles on it, and if you go too close, you might get hit on your cheeks. The third man touches the trunk of the elephant and decides that the definition of elephant is a huge rubber hose hanging down and moving all the time and making hissing noises when you go close. Psh, psh, sounds. Three definitions of the elephant, of three blind men, and then follows a terrible fight between the three as to which is the correct definition. He said, Madhva, Ramanuj, oh sorry, uh, this blind, that, you know, there's a big fight. And, you know, sometimes fights can become quite physical. There's one sitting on the other trying to strangle him and so on. The simple reason being, this is the definition of elephant. No, this is the definition of elephant. And the third, no, 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 you are both wrong. This is, And that's the time when a man walks in who can actually see, who is not blind. And he's, first he separates them, he said, stand up, come on. So what is this fight about? Oh, it's about the elephant, okay? So what is the fight? Elephant is this. No elephant. He said, this is very funny. All the three of you are right. He said, how can that be? He said, because an elephant is much more than your definitions. You're right. Not that you're wrong, from what you know you're right. You're right too, because you know that much. You're right too, because you know that much. But I can see, because I'm not blind, 
and I see that the elephant is much more than any of your uh, finite definitions. So therefore, look at all these definitions as finite interpretations of the puny little human brain and that the reality could be much more than all these definitions put together. We can't grasp it. So it's a good idea to say, well, this may be right, that may be right, but the ultimate is, can only be experienced and it may not, it can't be put in words. And all the writings that we have are attempts to put in words, describe the indescribable. So there may be friction, something may be different. We stop here. I think we have had a long evening and we need to stop now. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. I am th I'm, I'm very thankful that you sat here the whole evening and attended with complete attention. I can see that. That makes a satsang. Huh? Thank you very much. Anything else? No, out of thanks. No.